in our habitation. Last week, we uh, learned how to uh, inhabit the habitation, how to make a habit out of the habitation. So in this psalm from Moses, we have learned how God is our refuge and our shelter and a very present help in time of trouble. So uh, in this day and time, we need a shelter, we need refuge, and we need the Lord to be our refuge and not the world or the economy. And because those things are collapsing, they're corroding, they're corrupt, but the Lord is a strong tower and He is eternal and forever. So, let's start in prayer and we'll get on into our study. Lord, we just thank you and praise you, Lord God, that you brought us together tonight, Lord. We just pray and ask in Jesus' name, Lord God, that your hand be upon this study. Lord, we just pray that your truth, Lord God, will be uh, uh, elaborated. Lord, we pray and ask in Jesus' name, Lord God, that your truth will be clear and made known. Lord, we just pray that we trust in you as our strong tower and as our refuge, Lord God. And Lord, we just ask and pray in Jesus' name that you just uh, bind any hindrance from the enemy. Lord, we just pray in Jesus' name that you fight for us, that you be our defense and our shield. And Lord, we just ask and pray in Jesus' name, Lord God, that you open up the ears and the hearts and the minds and the eyes of those who are really listening tonight. And we just ask and pray in Jesus' name, Lord God, for your spirit to abide with us tonight in Jesus' name. Psalms 91, starting in verse 1. Like I've been saying, this was a uh, psalm from Moses. Most of the psalms are from David. But this was a psalm of Moses, a song that he sung to the children of Israel when they were probably either going through the wilderness or after they had gotten to the end of the wilderness. But after the Lord he had provided much for them uh, in the wilderness. And they were being shown that the Lord was their refuge. The Lord was their shelter and safety. The cloud by day and the fire by night. Not Egypt. They desired to go back to Egypt, but um, God had other plans. It's pretty bad when you desire to be back in slavery. And the reason they did that is because their flesh was crying out for something besides manna from heaven. Their flesh was crying out for the leeks and the, the things that they had back in Egypt. They would rather be in bondage than be in freedom because being in freedom requires w real work and we have been set free by Christ. And walking in that freedom responsibly requires work and much learning and teaching. But it's, easily, it's easy to be in slavery and in bondage and just have somebody tell you what to do. But that's not what God has called us to. God has not uh, delivered us from Egypt so he can be a taskmaster in the heavens. He wants us to be in freedom. He doesn't, want us to, he doesn't want to boss us around and tell us what to do and abuse us. He wants us to walk as free, but not using our liberty as a cloak of maliciousness. So starting in verse 1 in Psalms 91, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers and under His wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night nor for the arrow that flieth by day nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness nor for the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand shall fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand but it will not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, nor any plague come near your dwelling. He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, yes. lest you dash your foot against a stone. And getting into the meat of tonight's four verses, thou shalt trample, or thou shalt tread, Upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the serpent, you will trample under feet. I'm going to learn what, what the lion and the adder is tonight. Because he had set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he hath known my name. Do we know God's name? Who do you say God is? We know what the world says, but who do you say that he is? He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. And with long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. So, getting into tonight's four verses, concluding this study... Trampled under feet. We're going to learn a little bit about spiritual warfare. And in learning about spiritual warfare, this is going to kind of lead us into what we're going to be getting into here in the next month or two. Because I'm wanting to do a very thorough and elongated study 
into spiritual warfare, about defending the faith and contending for the faith that was once delivered to the saints, fighting for the common salvation. There's lots of salvations out there. There's lots of truths out there, but there's only one real truth. There's lots of things parading themselves as the truth. There's lots of things out there parading themselves as salvation, saying that they will save people, they will deliver people, but there's only one true salvation. Only one. What makes your salvation different than theirs? And what makes yours real and theirs exposed as false? You're going to have to prove that to the world. You're going to have to be able to show the world why you believe what you believe and why you've dedicated your life to it. And we're going to have to be equipped to do that in the last days. And so we're going to be learning about that here in the next two months. Or, yeah. Because we, we have been called to contend, to contend, which means to earnestly. Earnestly contend means earnestly fight for the faith, which means fight for the truth. So getting into verse 13. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder. The young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. What does it mean to tread on something? That's what they call tires. You know, the, the, the outward rim of the tires is tread. It means to stomp. It means to trample on. The lion and the adder, the young lion and the dragon, are all representative of Satan. So if, we're going, uh, if you would please turn to Luke 10, 17. We're going to learn about the authority, which really means power, that God has given us over Satan. He's given us power, and He expects us to execute that power. He expects us to use that power, not just sit on it. Luke 10, 17. Luke 10, verse 17. And Jesus answering said, Were there not... Let's see, I'm in the wrong one. <laughs> Luke 10, 17. I'm in Luke chapter 17. Okay. Luke 10, 17. Okay, I'm there. Yeah, and the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. There's two things I want to uh, notice about this verse. Subject. They're subject. Sub means under. They're under us. Submarine. Underwater. Subterranean. Underground. They're subject to us. They're under us. Through thy name but they're only subject to us through thy name. And in his name, as we're going to learn a little bit later, I will set him on high because he has known my name, is what the psalm said. Through his name we have power. Reading on in verse 18, And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. And it, the book I was just reading here recently, a guy, uh, he actually thinks that, uh, you know, this verse has always been understood that, you know, when Satan fell from heaven, with the third of the angels, Christ was there to see that, and they, some people think that's what he meant by this. And I don't know. I mean, he could have been one of the two. But uh, some, uh, uh, an author that I just read in a book from actually thinks that he might have seen Satan fall from heaven as they were casting the demons out of these people. Because they said even the demons are subject unto us. So uh, while they were out casting demons out of people, he was seeing Satan fall from heaven at the time they were casting demons out. Okay. Behold, in verse 19, I give, you, I give unto you power to tread. Tread means trample, stomp, march on. To tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. He has given us power over serpents and scorpions. Now, he wasn't talking about the physical animals, serpents and scorpions. He was talking about all the power of the enemy. He didn't say some of the power, but all the power of the enemy. If you see all the power of the enemy that's being released and unleashed in the world today, how Satan looks like he's just having a field day, that should show you a little, about, a little bit about Satan's power. He's an extremely powerful fallen angel, but he is a fallen angel. He's extremely powerful. But if you've got power over as much as power as what he has, then what does that say about the power that you have? It should say that you have a lot. We've been given a lot of power. So where's it at? Why aren't we using it? Why aren't we executing it? And why are we not utilizing it? It's not enough 
just to have money in the bank? Are you using that money? You know, if it just sits there, it's not doing anybody no good. So the power is in us through Christ, through His. Let's execute it. We must utilize it. We must use it. Okay. Let's look at the word jurisdiction. I'm sure you've heard this word before. Jurisdiction. Cody used to be a cop. Yeah. Tell us something about jurisdiction, Cody. Well, jurisdiction is uh, the best way I can explain it without even cheating it with the paper. It's, 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 it's a delegated realm of authority. Mm -hmm. It's like, uh, like one police officer. If you have a badge, you have the authority. If, if a police officer doesn't have jurisdiction, then he has no more authority than a regular citizen over past those Right. So, like, a, that's why people turn their head when they see a Chatsworth cop stopping somebody outside the city limits because they know in the back of their mind that that cop is outside of his jurisdiction. That's what his badge has a, given him. Mm -hmm. You know, and the state patrol, of course, has state jurisdiction. Right. And the federal has federal jurisdiction all over. But uh, it's, it's got a limit. Right. It's got a limit, right? It has a limit. Okay. Now, in having a limit, this is what we should see. Christ said what? He said, I give you power over how much of the enemy? All. All. So there is no limit. There is no limit to how much power he has given us. And it's at our disposal. It's at our... When we want to delegate it, we want to use it, it's there. Okay. Let's look at the word. Jurisdiction, legal authority, the authority to enforce laws or pronounce legal judgments. Now we have the authority, but are we enforcing it? You, a cop can pull somebody over when he knows that they've, been, you know, they've exceeded that speed limit. He can choose to write a ticket or not. He can choose to enforce the law or to have mercy. Now, God could have chose to punish us for our sins, but he chose to have mercy. He could have enforced the law, but he chose to have mercy. But in dealing with Satan, show no mercy. Show no mercy, because you won't be shown any. So we've got to learn how to be absolutely vicious with the sword of God. And I do mean vicious, because the violent will take the kingdom of heaven by force. That's what Christ said. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence from the days of John the Baptist, and the violent take it by force. So we have got to be violent, and we have got to be adamant in our stand against Satan. We can't be afraid to offend anybody because we are going to offend. We can't be afraid to get in conflicts because we're going to be conflicted. We can't be afraid to get in arguments with people because these things are going to happen. It's a part of defending the faith. I've not come to send peace, Christ said. I've come to send a sword. And the reason he said that is because the truth can't be compromised. If you're going to live the truth, and if you're going to stand up for the truth, then sooner or later you're going to bump heads with somebody. It's like what they were saying with the, the homosexuality thing. When, 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 he, when they were talking about this being promoted, mm -hmm. and you violently pray against that. You say, that's just wrong. So you have to take that desire of, 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 the, of the word inside of you, just burning. Right. And force. to advance the gospel through physical force. No. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Now, that doesn't mean that a, a man can't be a Christian and be in the military. That's a very godly thing, to be in the military and to fight for your country, fight yes. for the peace and the well-being of your country. That's a very godly thing. Uh, because God has, God has instituted, you know, talking in Romans 13, the powers that be are of God and are ordained of God. And we should fear because they do not bear the sword in vain. So police officers and military, God has established that, you know, Yes, order. 
Because if there was not any of those things, then we would live in an extremely chaotic world. And we already live in a chaotic world to begin with. So imagine if nobody was given any authority from God. Okay, but you've been given authority. And you've been given the authority to enforce laws. And let's look at the word law. What kind of laws have we been given the authority to enforce? What kind of laws have we been given the authority to enforce? There are laws that work in the universe. Laws of science. What goes up must come down, says gravity. There's also other laws of science. So is a law. So reaping is a law. That's right. Let's go to James chapter 4, verse 6, and we'll look at another law. James chapter 4, verse 6. A law pretty much says if this happens, then this other thing has to happen. An action and a reaction. Causality. James chapter 4, verse 6. But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. He resisteth the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. That's a law. God will resist the proud, but he will give grace to the humble. Okay, now this next part is the part I really want you to see. Okay, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil... And he will flee from you. You're enforcing that authority when you submit yourself to God and you resist the devil. He has to flee. Because he has to obey that law. He has to obey your authority and your power that God has given you. He has to flee. Reading on, draw nigh to God. And what happens? The action, the reaction. He will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and... And purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Let's look at another action and reaction. Verse 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. And what happens? He will lift you up. That's a law. If you humble yourself, God will lift you up. He's bound to His Word. So in jurisdiction, what we're seeing is, is we've been given authority over a certain area. We've been given authority over the power of the enemy. That we will trample him under feet. And, this, and we can attain this and we can achieve this in our lives. But we have to do it God's way. We have to do it the order of God. You've been given a badge. The blood of Christ. The seal of the Spirit. Once Satan sees that, he has to obey it. Pronounce. Okay, authority speaks of power. To enforce the laws is to put those laws into motion. To get, them, to get the ball rolling. The authority comes first. You've already been given the authority. Now it's time to enforce it. Pronounce legal judgments. We're here to pronounce legal judgments. Range of legal authority. And what is our range of legal authority? The area, the area over which legal authority extends. What is the area? Geographically speaking. The air. The prince of the power of the air. We battle Satan in the heavenly places. This is our jurisdiction. We must cast him down to the ground where he belongs. Yeah, it did. Could you not? Yeah, the air just... I mean, it, was just it, was like it was like a deflated balloon. It just a vacuum. I mean, it, it was amazing. I never, it, That's it, power. That. I mean, the air changed. Satan is watching you. And they will gather. Now, uh, I've also learned here in recent months that there are demons and there are fallen angels. Yeah. Now, there are fallen angels. They're very high in authority. And they are very high in rank. They're like the generals of Satan's army. And Satan has his political forte, whatever, or his, his army works just like a government. It works just like, and they're very ordered. Don't think that Satan has got horns and he's poking fun and cussing. And all. That Satan don't work like that. Satan is very intelligent. Satan is very ordered. If you saw Satan face to face, he probably 
be a very handsome guy with a tuxedo. Be the most beautiful human being you probably ever saw. That's very true. Yeah. They're a very ordered army. They're a very ordered uh, political force and government. Yeah. They're a kingdom. They're a kingdom. And they have very high-ranking people. They have very high-ranking generals. But you've been given power over them. You just have to believe that. You just have to enforce that. You just have to get educated in that and learn and get hungry for the Word of God and start exercising that authority. Because you do not have to live in bondage. We've been set free from that. So whom the Son sets free is free indeed. But who, of whom a man is brought in bondage, uh, of whom a man is brought in bondage is the same as he's slave to. So um, the range of legal authority is the area over which legal authority extends is, is we've been given authority over the prince of the power of the air in the heavenly places. We cast him down where he belongs. Genesis 3.15 talks about where God said, And I will put enmity between thy seed and her seed. He shall bruise thy head, and you will bruise his heel. In other words, another is speaking of how we've been given authority. We have stomped on the head of Satan. He is under us. He is subjected to us. If a king has a son who is a prince, and the king has subjects, those subjects must obey his son. We've been given that same kind of authority. There has to be a respect, right? I mean, we can't rejoice in that authority. We, but we, there, it's, like a, it's like business. Right. This is business. We're, we're taking care of business. Right. That's kind of military. Because a lot of people will, will, will get puffed up, and that's exactly what God doesn't want you to do. You, you take the Bible, of course, but it's like a military business thing. Mm-hmm. Because, it, you know, he talks about, you know, even uh, Michael or Gabriel didn't. Or something like that uh, in, in the Word of the Old Testament. Uh, it has to be with a humbleness, but with violence. Right. Uh, it, it, respect. Respect. In other words, you can score a touchdown, you can spike the ball, and you can celebrate, but don't disrespect the other team. Don't show off, yeah. and don't run up and score. Right. right. It says in Luke, that same scripture you was uh, sharing. Yeah. Right, that's a, that's a good that's a good punctuation to what we were just saying. Yeah, yeah. Don't rejoice because you know you've got power over Satan. You know, don't make fun of him. Don't don't tease him. Yeah. Don't taunt him. No. You'll get a flag on the play, unsportsmanlike conduct. Yes. You will. We're here to be professional about what we do. Yes. Okay, uh, 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 and 5. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 and 5. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 and 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. Through God, they're mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds. Casting down, casting down what is up must come down. Satan dwells in pride. Satan is swelled with pride. What goes up must come down. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, taking things that are high and casting them down. Behold, we will see Satan fall like lightning from heaven. It happens that quick. That's how, that's how adamant our authority is in God. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. What we're doing is we're taking ground. We have been given jurisdiction over an area. That area is the earth. We're going forth in the earth. But to gain ground in the earth, we must first get it in the heavenlies. Whatsoever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. We're taking ground. War is about taking real estate. That's what war is about. War is about real estate. It's about going forward. It's about advancing. Going forward. Joshua, 
Whatever, wherever your feet stand, wherever your feet trample on, that ground, that land is yours to take. So wherever we go, wherever our feet stand, wherever we plant our flag, that, that ground is ours. And we are looking to, to advance this gospel into the world, advance this word of God into the world. In the book of Acts is the best example. Many times, several times in the book of Acts it says, and the word of God continued to grow and multiply. And the word of God continued to grow and multiply. And sometimes it says that after there was great persecution against the church. No matter how much persecution Rome or the Jews brought against the church, the word of God continued to grow and multiply. Maybe that's why it's not growing and multiplying like we would see it to do today because there is no persecution. It's not stirring up any life in, inside of anybody. There's too much comfort. There's too much luxury. And you don't find too much comfort and luxury on a battlefield. The apostles were being persecuted to the max. They were being uh, thrown to the lions. They were being, their heads were being put on posts. They were being crucified. And, but yet, still, that was not enough to stop the word of God from growing and multiplying. It went forward and forward and forward. Casualties left and right, but yet still there are some going forward and forward and forward. And that's what we have to come to. Oprah Winfrey says one thing. We say something else. The world's going to believe one of those two things. Who do you think the world's going to believe? The world's going to believe Oprah Winfrey right now. Because the world thinks the church is a joke. Because there's been scandal after scandal after scandal of televangelists. Christians do not stand up for their faith anymore. We don't contend for the faith like, we need, like we're supposed to. Because we have been taught that, number one, discernment is unbiblical. If we discern and we see something wrong in the church, if we see something wrong in somebody's doctrine, we shouldn't offend them. We shouldn't stand up. And, and for the truth, we should just all get along and be at peace because Christ wants us to live in peace, does He not? He did not come to send peace. He came to send a sword. When He said, blessed are the peacemakers, He meant amongst individuals. But when the truth is at stake... The truth cannot be compromised. Then there must be war. War is a, is a necessary evil. War is W-A-R. We are right. God says, this is my word and this is the truth. And Satan says, I don't care what the truth is. I will establish my own truth and I will recreate man in my image. And I will make this my world. And I will bring mankind into subjection and bondage and I will be the God of this world. Who is to stop him and tell him he can't do it? We're the only ones. Because the world's not going to do it. Hinduism isn't going to do it. Buddhism isn't going to do it. Islam isn't going to do it. Those are all false religions. They're posing themselves as something that is backed by a real deity, a real God, but they are not. We are the ones who have the real God. Why must we fear? But we are. We're scared to death. Why? Why? Because Satan is battling the church with fear. He's bringing fear against us. And why is he bringing fear against us? Because he knows our potential. He knows the power. He knows more than we do about the authority and the jurisdiction, the legal authority and the laws that God has given us to enforce the power to enforce upon him. And he would have us to stay in ignorance. He would have us to stay in comfort. And he would have us stay in luxury. He would have us to sell our inheritance for a bowl of beans. Because if we notice, if we realize and really think about who we really are, and we really see ourselves for who we really are, and we really have a revelation of who we really are, once we get a hold of that, and once we really see that, we're going to rise up and we're going to take him down. And he don't want that. So he discourages us and he enslaves us through chains of comfort and luxury, that's why the prosperity message has been so prevalent in the church for the last 10 or 20 years because if you can get people comfortable, you can get them fat. And we learned a few weeks ago, if you have a fat frog, it can't jump. So the, the fatter and the lazier and the heavier our ears are and the duller our understanding is, the less we can do against Satan, the less powerful we are against Satan. But the Bible says, gird up the loins of your mind. And Dr. MacArthur great teacher out in California taught, gird up the loins of your mind means this. It means uh, uh, in the old times they wore robes. And in wearing those robes, you know, they could walk around and talk and fellowship and go to market or whatever in those robes, no problem. But when it came time to run a race, 
when it came time to fight a war, they had to take up those, those robes and they had to tie them up close to them and tie all the loose ends up so they could run. You hear me? So what that means, and then they, their legs were free to run a race or fight a war. So what that means is tie up all the loose ends of your thinking. When it says gird up the loins of your mind, it means to tie up all the loose ends of your thinking. Get all the clutter and the junk out of your thinking. Mind is lazier than the body. Understand that. There's a lot of things that you know you need to do sometimes that really require no physical strength, but yet you still don't want to get up and do them because the mind doesn't want to have to engage and exercise and to fool with all these functions that it has to... The mind is lazier than the body. Remember that. So to be effective in warfare, first we must go through training. We got to get fit. We got to get in shape. It's preseason. It's training camp. We got a season ahead of us where we're going to vie for a crown. We're going to contend for a championship. But first we got to get trained. First we have to get trained physically and we have to get trained mentally. We have to get our mind where it needs to be and then we have to get educated on how to fight the war and then to play the game. So that's where we're going. Not just this church, but the kingdom of heaven. And God knows those that are His that will contend in this war. Okay, moving along. All the animals mentioned are references to Satan. The lion and the adder, the young lion and the dragon, shalt thou trample under feet. These are references to Satan, every one. A lion. If you can trample a lion under feet, you've got some power. Lion, both Christ and Satan, are referred to as lions in the Bible. Revelation 5.5. 5, Who is worthy to loose the book and to open the seals thereof? The lion of the tribe of Judah. That's the only time Christ is mentioned as the lion of the tribe of Judah in the Bible is there in Revelation 5.5. 5. He is looked at as a lion. And then Satan is looked at as a lion. 1 Peter 5.8. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's just looking for somebody that's vulnerable. Okay, uh, both Christ and Satan are referred to as lions in the Bible, like Mufasa and Scar and the Lion King. That's a good picture of it. The Bible here is talking about animals that inhabit the wastelands and deserts. So you should stay out of the wastelands and the deserts. But the, but the world, the earth, is a wasteland. It is a desert. It's a ruin. It's been destroyed. Physically, it's getting there. Because the Bible says, is this him? Is this he? You know, talking about Satan when he comes before the judgment at the end of the world. Is this him that brought the nations to shame, that turned the world into a desert? And if you look at it, if this world went on for another 100, 200 years, the way they're cutting trees down, the way we're polluting the environment, it might be a, a desert in another 100, 200 years. Yeah. Satan seeks to destroy. He wants to destroy mankind because mankind is the only image of God that exists outside of heaven. And he wants to destroy mankind just to spite God. He wants to destroy mankind through bondage because he wants to ha keep mankind in slavery. He wants to rule over mankind because he wants to be God. Well, even young Christians, they're saved. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times they're not taught. And Satan can get in there. He can't have that young person that's been saved. Yeah. Yeah, because... Well, now go ahead. The, the prosperity gospel, and, and not just that, I mean, we're not just against that. It's, it's, it's just, I don't even think the prosperity gospel even, that's the problem. It's a, it's a thing of self. Mm -hmm. what, what the Holy Spirit revealed to me is, is, you know, it's not the prosperity that's such a big problem. It's me, me, me. What can I get? What can I achieve physically? We are to, to deny ourselves and take up our cross. And, and, and if we're to crucify Right. You know, and they, 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 he, we are to have this. We are to, to not raise ourselves up. You know, we are to be prosperous, yes, but for the kingdom. Right. Yeah, and, 
Yeah. And it just it defines how you define, I mean, it depends on how you define prosperous. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't just have to be money. But he's you know. rendered the church helpless, just snatched in with double hooks with this false uh, teaching and stuff, uh, because they're so, they're running on this treadmill of, of this thing when they're not working on the souls of men. Yeah. Repentance and holiness has not been, is not the focus anymore. It's self. And, you know, the heart of revival is repentance because that's what John said. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then the greatest revival happened, the coming of Christ, you know. So that must be our message. If we would have a John the Baptist generation that says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and that John the Baptist generation will be the one that ushers in the second coming of Christ. So I think, yeah, that God is definitely going to have a generation that is going to proclaim to roll out the red carpet for his son. So, uh, the lion is the power of Satan in full force. Rome was looked at as the lion in Psalm 22. You know, it gives a great description uh, prophesying of the sufferings of Christ there in Psalm 22. Uh, the, the lion is looked at as Rome. Speaks of evil power that has come to fruition i.e. a destructive behavior. You know, destructive behavior starting in the mind. And, and, and talking about the mind, we'll get there with young lions in a little bit, but the lion is the power of Satan at its full force. It's hard to overcome a lion. And you could not overcome a lion in your own strength. But the strength that God has given you, you shall tread upon the lion. The adder or cobra, that's what it means here, is cobra. The cobra is the most venomous snake known to man that speaks of the lies of Satan as they are poison. Cobra is the most venomous snake known to man. And that's what the lies of Satan are. The word of Satan. I was reading today where Christ was uh, talking to his disciples right before you know, he was going to be crucified. Uh, or I th- no, it was actually John chapter 8. And he said, uh, he's talking to the Pharisees. He said, you are of your father, the devil. And the lust of your father you will do. For he abode not in the truth. Meaning... He at one time was in the truth. He was in the spotlight of truth, but he didn't stay there because there was no truth in him. So there is no truth in Satan. Anything that comes out of Satan's mouth or mind is a lie, and it's a lie that is extremely fatal and dangerous. It's poison. And the only way that it can have any effectiveness is if you believe it and you let it get deep into your soul. Now you can resist him, Resist that poison, and it won't have any effect on your life. It will not take root, in other words. Okay, uh, the young lions, the young lions, a thought that is still growing and hungry for mental attention. There's thoughts in your mind that Satan puts there that wants your attention, that wants that, that Satan wants you to give attention to, that wants to grow into confession and confession into a habit and a habit into a lifestyle and a lifestyle into just a life and a destiny and an eternity. Yeah. Lies. You know, that's poison. Yeah. What makes them particularly scary is their roar, yeah. and that, that that's what they that's what they use their roar for is to intimidate, and, and not only to intimidate but and to put fear into, but to catch off guard and to make you do that. And while you shudder, that's when they go in. That roar has a has a purpose, and Satan roars. We hear the roar of the enemy. We, well, if I stand up and witness these people, well, if I do this or I go in here with my Bible, I mean, the roar of the enemy. But it's just a roar. He has been, he has been dethroned from his power and he has been defeated. Yeah. You've been given power over him. So don't, don't let the roar intimidate you. Okay, serpent. What is a serpent? Subtle, the, 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 the serpent in the garden, 
with subtle, more than any other creature the Bible says, subtle and secretive weapons and tactics of the enemy. In other words, this is speaking of a mental advantage. The young lion and the dragon, with the dragon, when it says the dragon, it really means serpent. And dragon, you know, the Bible talks about Satan as the dragon. But this dragon right here in Psalm 91 really means a serpent. Uh, subtle and secretive weapons and tactics of the enemy. God will give you the, the mental stamina. God will give you the mental ability and the intelligence through His Word. It's all in here to defeat the serpent and to be tricky. To be trickier than he is. To defeat him at his own game. The Bible says be as wise as serpents. Be as wise as them. Be wiser than them. Be wiser than serpents. Don't be just as wise as one, but be wiser than one. I think is what Christ was saying. Okay, let's look at the word trespass. To encroach on somebody. To intrude on somebody's privacy or time. Break moral or social law. To commit a sin or break a social law. Enter somebody else's land unlawfully. To go on somebody else's land or enter somebody else's property without permission. Trespassing. You're somewhere where you ain't supposed to be. Satan is in the church. He's trespassing. So we got to use our jurisdiction, our authority, and enforce it and get him out of the church because he's in the church. And this is where he seeks to be. Now I want you to understand something. There's two end zones in this fight, in this game. We're trying to get out there in the world to take this ball to the world and get it into the end zone of people's hearts because the God of this world has blinded the eyes of those that believe not lest they should see the glorious gospel of Christ. In other words, meaning if they did see it like it should be seen and believe it. If they saw it, then they would believe it. But they can't see it because they're in darkness. We're seeking to take this light, this ball, and get it into people's hearts. Because once it's in people's hearts, it's like a seed in the ground. The rest will happen by itself. Once you plug the connection up, once you plug the plug-in up to the power outlet, the rest happens by itself. Once we get the word into people's hearts, that's a score. Because then their lives will be changed forever. His word will not come back void. Now that's where we're, we're trying to get to. That's our end zone. Satan's end zone is right here. This is where he wants to get. He wants to get behind this pulpit and he wants to speak lies into, into the ears and the heart of God's people. So he can infiltrate the church, change the truth into a lie because that's what the book of Romans says and then change the truth of God into a lie and worship the creature more than the creator. And that's what's going on in a lot of churches. They're worshiping the creature more than the creator. Uh, men of God are being lifted up like they are God. And they're being, they've got all these followings as if they are God. So the church is worshiping and serving creatures more than the Creator. But this is Satan's end zone. He wants to get into the church. The church is being infiltrated right now by false doctrine, false teachers. And you see this all throughout the New Testament. All throughout the New Testament. And in the seven letters that Christ uh, wrote to the uh, churches in Revelation, He speaks every time just about of false teachers and false doctrine. Paul spoke about it all the time because Satan has his ministers in the church and they're trying to deceive the people of God and they're trying to change the truth. So and it, it yeah, and it's going on a lot more than what you might think. He takes, he takes, uh, I think he takes your, you're talking about spiritual authority, he takes the saints' mouths and their authority, their spiritual authority, and uses it against them without unbelief, saying, having them confess, like in James, confess things that, Mm -hmm. on the outward. Right. You know, and look at, oh, man, look at this multitude. Oh, goodness, this is a scary thing. And this is just awful. And the influence that a lot of these great men of God have is going to be used because when the time comes to make a decision, are you going to follow this or are you going to follow that? Well, a lot of these big-time preachers that a lot of these people have so much faith in are going to dissuade the people to follow the lie. And it's coming. It's coming. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what's amazing is how science bears out the Bible. Cobra's poison yeah. is a neurotoxin. It, it paralyzes the nervous system. Right. It causes you not to be able to breathe. Yeah. The Spirit of God is true off. I mean, it's Spirit that breath. Right. The Spirit of God, it causes us not to be able to breathe in the life of God. Right. We
Yeah. And poison is spitting your eyes, blinds you. Right. Right. We know uh also you said the nervous system? Yes. Now is the nervous system that's where we get our senses, isn't it? Right now. So he wants to disable our senses. Yes. The Bible says, you know, in Hebrews whose senses are exercising, what did we just talk about? We talked about exercising, preparing for the game, preparing for battle, exercising, who have their uh, senses exercised by reason of use, our spiritual senses. So we can discern, you know, we can see the enemy, and we can see the lies that he tried to, tries to perpetrate. And smell is, you know, just another sense, uh, sense of something's not right. Right. But that's that's what we're what we're moving into. That the true Christian living like he's supposed to, like we we're supposed to, looks like a, a, a nut job, you know, because to the world, because it's alien. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, it's alien to. And, and it should be attractive to the world. Now we're not going to try to be attractive to the world to win the world. In other words, well, I got to be a gangster rap so I can win the gangster rappers. No, you know. <laughs> now. You know, the world wants something that's different, you know. They don't want just somebody just like them. The Bible says that they know us by the love we have for Right, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Well, the, see, the, the thing is, I have a lot of people. That's a good word right there. That, that are, She's right. That, are, that support. But I'm just saying I have a few people that, that, that have seen the change in my life through my testimony, through things, that they're lashing out and they're like, oh, my goodness, you know, you know mm-hmm. it's not a phase. Right. It, oh, it's not, it's not a phase this time. Well, our life is one of the best testimonies, you know. You know, I mean, it, you, know, this, you know, I've seen God deliver me out of the hand of things. Right. Well, uh, like I said, you know, our lives are the best testimony. Um, we are a letter written and seen of all men. Okay, in verse 14, summing it up, because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he hath known my name. Where are we setting our love? Where are we setting our love? Colossians 3, 1, set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. For your life is hid with Christ in God. Colossians 3, 1. I think King James says, set your affections on things above, not on things in the earth. Do we know God's name? Well, of course, His name's Jesus. His name's Jehovah. Do we know God's name? Do we call God by name? Do we understand, God, do we understand God's reputation as Lord and Savior in our life? Do you know him as Lord and Savior? Do you know, do you have a testimony of how he saved you, being a Savior? Do you have a testimony of how you follow him obediently, him being a Lord? Who is Jesus to you? Jesus asked the same question to his disciples. Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? This seems like a simple question, but really it's not. Who do you say Jesus is? Well, he's my husband, and we argue from time to time, but at the end of the day... We're very romantically in love with each other. <laughs> Jesus is our husband. Understand that. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. God will honor us. That's pretty powerful. I will deliver him and honor him. Okay, with long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now let's go into Cody's uh, word that he shared tonight. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, again. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 17. They're up against the odds here. They got a, a big game to go, to fight, to play. The other team is 10 and 0. They're big underdogs. Not a chance, not a hope. What happens? 2 Chronicles 20, verse 17. Second Chronicles 20, verse 17. You shall not, okay, I'm reading now the Amplified. You shall not need to fight in this battle. Take your positions. Everybody there? Verse 17, 
2 Chronicles 20, verse 17. You shall not need to fight in this battle. Take your positions. That's a good word right there. Take your positions. And some he called apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors, and teachers. What's your position? Take your position. Whatever it is that God's called you to do, get there. Well, I'm not ready. Get ready. Yeah. We need order in the house of God. We need leaders. We need leaders, not followers. Leaders. We need leaders. Life is a journey. Drivers wanted. You shall not need to fight in this battle. Take your positions. Whatever it is that God's called you to do, do it. Get into that calling. Exercise that gift. Stand still and see the deliverance of the Lord. Who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem? Fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. That's all you need, that word. We've been given the word. Go out tomorrow, for the Lord is with you. What word has, has been given to us? I give you power over all. I give you authority over all the power of the enemy. Go out tomorrow and take him down. You're going to win. Is that not a word? That's the same thing that God said right here. He said, go out tomorrow, and you will defeat him. It's the same thing as saying, I give you authority over all the power of the enemy. It's good as gold. So what we see right here is that we see three things in verse 17. You shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, I think the King James says. Stand still and see the deliverance of the Lord. Set, stand, and see. Two things on your part, God will take care of the last part. If you set yourself, prepare, that's what it means. It means to prepare. We're in the huddle now. The play's being called. Now we're all going up to the line. We're all going to where we're supposed to be, on the line. And we're getting in formation, in the right formation. And we're setting ourselves. And then the ball's about to be snapped. And when the ball's snapped, there's going to be a touchdown because that's, that's the part God's going to take care of. Then you will see the salvation of the Lord. Set, stand, and see. So set, prepare, get where you're supposed to be in your calling. Stand, stand when all you've done, when you've done all you can do. Stand, Paul said, stand on that truth. Don't waver from it. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Let that man not think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. But stand, doesn't matter what the rest of the world is doing. Stand, it doesn't matter how things are going. Stand, stand firm in the Word of God. Be firm and steadfast. And then you will see the salvation of the Lord. The Lord takes care of the third part. Set and stand. Get where you're supposed to be. And be very steadfast in it. And don't let circumstances dictate. So now let's go to Ezekiel chapter 33 real quick and we'll close up. Ezekiel 33. We're going to learn a little bit about the wastelands. And we're going to learn a little bit about the judgment of God. And I think this is to the church. Ezekiel 33. Ezekiel 33 verse 23. Again, I'm reading out of the... Uh, Amplify. Ezekiel 33, verse 23. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, like I said, I'm reading out of the Amplified, Son of man, those back in Palestine who inhabit those wastes of the ground of Israel are saying, Abraham was only one man and he inherited the land, but we are many. The land is surely given to us to possess as our inheritance. Abraham was one man. So if Abraham was one man and could do the job, hey, we're many, we can get it done. Not necessarily, is what God is saying. Why? Therefore say to them, thus says the Lord, you eat meat with the blood as an idolatrous rite and lift up your eyes to your filthy idols and shed blood. Abraham didn't do that. Shall you then possess the land? No. Because you're in idolatry which is spiritual adultery, and you're shedding blood, you ain't going to just possess the land because you have the might to do so. In other words, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Yeah. Verse 26, you stand upon your sword as your dependence. Jeremiah says, cursed is he who trusts in the arm of the flesh to save him. In other words, they think that their might can do it. Again, they're thinking their might can get them through. Not by might. You commit abominations and each of you defiles your neighbor's wife. 
So spiritual adultery has bled into physical adultery. Shall you then possess the land? Say this to them. We're looking to possess the land. Is that, we've been talking about that tonight. We've been talking about how war is going forward and the word of God increased and multiplied throughout the earth and we're looking to take real estate, territory, to take this word out into the world and wherever our feet shall trample on, that ground is ours to take. We're looking to go in and possess the land. But they could not possess the land. Say this to them in verse 27. Thus says the Lord God, As I live, surely those who are in the waste places shall fall by the sword. Because one reason is because they're living by it. And him that is in the open field without any refuge. What have we been learning here in Psalms 91 the past three weeks? God is our refuge. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. They were not abiding in a shadow. They're in the open field. They're the loners. They're the ones trusting in their own strength. They're the ones that's out there. I don't need to go to church to, to, to know God. I don't need to associate with Christians to know God. I don't need to read the Bible to know God. They're out there in the open field. The sun is beating down upon them. They're exposed and they're vulnerable to the elements. And him that is in the open field will I give to the beast to be devoured. In other words, the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent, the dragon, is going to trample these fools under their feet. They don't have power over scorpions and serpents. They're going to be vulnerable to the beast of the field. They're not going to tread the lion and the adder. The lion and the adder is going to tread them. And Satan is the great lion that's going to devour Christians that are in the open field. Probably a lot of them not here tonight because of the cares of this life and of this world. They're not attending to the Word of God. They're attending to their needs. But God is our refuge, and God will attend to our needs. Him that is in the open field will I give to the beast to be devoured. And those who are in strongholds and in caves shall die by pestilence, disease. In other words, they won't be able to hide. Won't be able to hide. That's right. Yeah, deliver one to Satan so that, to that the Satan. soul may be saved. Well, their soul may be saved, but their flesh will be destroyed. Yeah, I was reading, I was reading somewhere uh, here recently that that means to be put out of the church because when they're put out of the church and out of the congregation, they're not un, they're not do what? They're in the field. Yeah, they're in the field. Yeah. They're not under the covering of God anymore. Yeah. Yeah, they're they're in the open field. Now, if you're in an open field. Now the lions and the uh, hyenas and all those uh, predator animals out there in, in the savannah and Serengeti, they, they dwell out there in the open fields. If you're in an open field and there is no tree to run to, there is no cave to run into, there is no nut, there's no lake to jump into because lions don't like water. You're a target. And you can run as fast as you want to, but you're going to get weary. They're going, that lion's going to run you down. There's nowhere to hide. And... In the kingdom of God, there's nowhere to hide. Your sins, you know, some go beforehand and some follow after. You should make sure that yours go beforehand. But this is a word to the church. This is a word to this church. Yes. Say this to them. Thus says the Lord God, As I live, surely those who are in the waste places, what are the waste places? The ruins, that which has been destroyed, the past. You're dwelling in your past. You're still bound by your past. You can't get out of your past. You can't get power over your past. God has given you power over your past, but you're not exercising it. You don't want to get out of it. You're bound by it. It's the waste places. It's been destroyed. It's gone. Go forward. But you're dwelling there. And you'll fall by the sword. Because the Word of God is going to pierce you. It is a sword. And him that is in the open field will I give to the beast to be devoured. Just explain that. That which God has given you power over now has power over you. And those who are in strongholds and in caves, strongholds, 
Lord is good, a stronghold, I think the book of Nahum says. But the Bible says we are casting down strongholds. In other words, the enemy has strongholds. Thoughts, addictions, things that we deal with. And in caves, the secret places, and in darkness, those who are dwelling in these things shall die by disease. Envy is the rottenness of the bones, the Bible says. And this is a word to the church. Verse 28, that's what God dealt with me whenever I was sitting in my living room in my computer. The pomp of their strength, that's what I had in me. I felt like I was strong enough. I didn't have to go to church. I didn't need to. I didn't need to do that. That's just cut to me. That's what happened to me. Well, it's about to cut a lot of people. I mean, that's, that's what... I mean, that's, that was awesome. it, It's about to cut a lot of people because God is getting ready to judge the church. and God, my strength. Right. And God getting ready to judge the church because judgment must begin at the house of God. There's fixing to get something. Something's really fixing to get turned in this world. At 2012, I ain't saying that mind calendar and everything, all that's right. But God's getting ready to do something. And he's going to deal with the church. If you can't attend to my word, if you can't come in here and dedicate yourself to me, but you're dedicated to the cares of this world on Wednesday night because that's where most of them are right now in front of the TV or doing whatever. If you have a job and you're working, that's fine. That's understandable. But what I'm saying, if you can be here and if you can take up your cross and be here and you're not here, that's not satisfying to the Lord. What are you really attending to? What are you really giving your heart to? Where are you setting your affections? Where are you setting your mind? God said, because He has set His love upon me, therefore will I deliver Him. You're not, we're not setting our loves on God anymore. We're setting our love on the things of the world, on the cares of this life. That stuff comes first. God will come somewhere down the line when I have time for Him. One of these days, God's not going to have time for those people because time's going to be up. Eternity will begin. Verse 28, And I will make the land of Israel. Of Israel. He didn't say the land of the Philistines. He didn't say the land of Egypt. He said the land of Israel. His chosen people. A desolation and a waste. You don't think God will drop an atomic bomb on the church? Lay it waste? What is our judgment? Our judgment, I've, all, I've heard, is the preachers and the teachers that inhabit our pulpits. That's our judgment because they have made the church drunk. They have infiltrated the church with lies. That's our judgment. Our judgment is false teachers and preachers and being given over to them. The rock stars and the superstars that have watered down the Word of God and taken away our conviction that we used to have with the world, they've taken that away. The adulterers that inhabit the pulpit. Scandal after scandal. And now our Word doesn't mean anything in the eyes of the world anymore. That's our judgment. A drunk church. A sleeping church where now anybody can come in and prophesy to the people of God. He told them in Micah, if somebody was drunk, they would be the prophet of this people. And that's what we have. Teachers, preachers, that are teaching false doctrine and corrupting the people of God. That's our judgment. Verse 28, And I will make the land of Israel, I'll make the church desolate. I'll make the church a waste place. I will send a famine on the church, not for food, but for the word of God. And I think this is something God's really wanting to say right now. Where are they at? He's calling, calling, us to repentance and calling us to repentance and holiness. He said, he said be holy for I am holy. Right. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Call, him, call upon him and seek him while he's at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand. I've stretched out my hand to a gainsaying people. But my hand is not shortened that it cannot save, the Lord says. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And I will make the land of Israel a desolation and a waste and her proud might, her proud might, the cocky, arrogant, televangelist preachers on the TV thinking they can say anything they want, speaking great swelling words. And her proud might shall cease. God's putting an end to it. Going to expose some of these rock stars that everybody thinks so much of in the church that have all this attention. 
and that everybody thinks so highly of. And the mountains of Israel shall be desolate that no one will pass through them. Then shall they know, understand and realize that I am the Lord when I have made the land a desolation and a waste because of of all the abominations which they have committed. That, I believe, is what is coming. I believe it's coming to this church. I believe it's coming to every church. God is going to filter out and God is going to weed out. That's, That's the process. A weeding out. We preach in special forces training through a weeding out process. We make it punishing, as punishing as we possibly can. We make it as hard as we possibly can because we want to weed out those people that's going to get tired and faint in their minds and give up. And the book of Hebrews says, Consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. People are giving up in their minds. They're being defeated in their minds. And God wants to weed these people out that are too weak to go on, that won't push a little bit further and go on with Him and finish what they started that didn't count the cost. God is weeding the church out of the people that are just here to show up on Sunday because that's all they're doing. They're just showing up on Sunday. But they're not committed to Christ. They're not a disciple of Christ. They don't have a life that is committed to God. They're not in a marriage. They think they're still just dating. Well, God's not dating. God ain't going to go and bebop with nobody on Saturday night. God wants a relationship and a commitment. And if the people were committed, then a lot of them would be here tonight, but they're not. Like I said, if you got a job, that's fine. But God is wanting a commitment. And we have got to be committed to God because as I'm fixing to teach you in the next month or two, we're going to contend for the faith. We're going to defend the faith because that's what we've been called to. And in standing up for that faith, we will be persecuted. We will be singled out. And so we need need to be committed to and we've got to be in this for the long haul. We've got to be in it to win it. Do we, want, do we want to win a championship or do we just want to go to the playoffs? If we go to the playoffs and, and, and we lose, that's fine. We can re-say we did something. That's not what we want to do. We want to go to the Super Bowl and win it. We want to hoist the trophy high. We want to win. And that needs to be our mindset that we want to win. We want to go forward and win. We're here for a reason. We're in it to win it. That needs to be our focus. And a lot of the people in the church are not focused. They're focused on their lives and their problems and the cares of this life. And that's why they're not here tonight. So, that's what repentance is. It's Yeah, absolutely. So uh, next week when we begin a study, we're going to begin a, a long study of warfare, contending for the faith, defending the faith. And next week, I'm going to let, uh, the, the, the title of the message will be, What is Truth? First, we're going, to, we're going to learn about what we are defending, the truth. What is truth? And the, the main verse for the next week will be, uh, I don't know what verse it is, but you can look it up real quick, Cody, if you want to. Um, where Pilate asked Jesus, What is truth? I always thought that was very extro- uh, just very interesting that he asked him that. What is truth? If somebody asked you what truth was, could you tell them what it was? And if you can't tell them, and if you can't explain to them, then they really have no reason to believe in what you believe. Because if you can't explain that to them, then they're just going to look at you and say, you don't know what you're talking about. We've got to know what we're talking about. We can't just talk it. We've got to know what we're talking about. So next week, what is truth? We're going to be learning what we're defending. We're going to be learning what truth is. And then we're going to be learning what warfare is. And we're going to learn how to contend earnestly for the faith that was delivered to the saints, the common salvation. Because the common salvation has become uncommon. Because it's not the same salvation. John 18, 38. Read read that verse real quick. That's the end of the verse? Yeah, that's the end of that right there. Pilate asked, what is truth? What did he say in the next verse? What, what did he say right after that? What was that? Amplify? 
the message 